Recently, I was asked to do my atheist role play at a private Christian school in Florida. Now, normally audiences know that I'm just role playing and that I'm really a Christian professor and apologist. But in this case, the Bible teacher insisted that he actually tell them that I'm a real atheist and that I went along with it. He didn't think most of them would recognize me. A few did, but they didn't blow my cover. So I start off, get introduced in this video you're about to see as an atheist friend of the Bible teacher. And then I jump in for about probably 30, 35 minutes, answer some questions, then take off the glasses, reveal who I really am, and talk about some lessons we can learn for the church and beyond. Whether you're a Christian or an atheist, I think you're going to enjoy this. Now, if you're an atheist and you're watching this, I hope you realize that I aim to give an atheist defense as clearly as I can. I try not to set up a straw man. So you might answer some questions differently than me, but I think you'll find that I'm trying to fairly represent atheism. So if you know somebody else, Christian or atheist, that might enjoy this kind of exchange, please consider sharing it with them. Check this out. Enjoy. I'm bringing my friend Sean up to speak today. He's got his PhD in philosophy, and he teaches out in California at UCLA. And he had told me a while back that he was going to be here in Florida for a convention of philosophy at UM. And I thought if you could come by and pretty much do what I do to you guys every week in apologetics class uh, and just press you on what you believe and why you believe it. Uh, but this time, it's not just going to be someone pretending. And so I hope you guys are up for that challenge. He's going to share some of his story with you and then also take a few questions from you guys. So as he's sharing his story, uh, have a few questions ready, maybe a few objections uh, waiting. But uh, pretend you're in, Ming in uh, my class at this moment because uh, it's going to kind of feel like apologetics in here to some degree. Uh, because, again, we've got skeptic and believer. So uh, if you would give a great round of applause for my friend Sean as he comes out. Hey, thanks for having me. This is a unique opportunity. I teach at a school in Southern California at a university, so I obviously work with university students normally. But when the opportunity came to come to a Christian school, which is obviously very different than where I teach at UCLA. I was like, sure, I'll share my story a little bit. And then we have two mics that will roam around, and you can ask me anything you'd like to ask me. So I teach philosophy, but I'm not a Christian. I, I didn't make the sign, but that's fine. Atheist encounter, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. Now I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I grew up in a Christian home in Northern California, kind of outside of San Francisco. I used to go to church. I went on mission trips. Where I lived, mission trips would like go down to Mexico, help the kids who were less fortunate there. I would read my Bible. I would share my faith. I even would get $10 tithing, or no, I'd get $10 allowance each week, and I would tithe like a dollar in the allowance tray because that's what I was told, 10% to be a good Christian young man. I believe this story. But when I got to the university, I started encountering people with very, very different worldviews who had ideas I had never thought about before and who were actually really smart in what they believed. And I had a conversation with a student. I was a freshman, and she pressed back and asked me a couple questions I had never thought about before as a Christian. My first thought was, well, this is what my pastor taught me. Well, this is what my parents taught me. This is what the Bible says. But then my fourth thought for me is what I would call a game changer. My fourth thought was, honestly, I really don't have a clue the answer to what you're talking about. I've just been told what to believe. I'm going to actually go research this, read both sides, and see where the truth leads. To make a long story short, after I started to read people with different worldviews, I came to the conclusion there's no good scientific evidence that God exists. There's no reason to think the Bible is true, let alone inspired. I mean, there's far too many contradictions and errors and mistakes in the Bible, not to mention things like misogyny and slavery and genocide to come from a holy God. 
And frankly, I'm not sure Jesus existed. He might have. But I think the Christian story is better explained as being patterned after these dying and rising gods of the ancient Near East. So I became an atheist. Now, I don't know, maybe some of you here are not Christians. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I know what it's like to be in a community when everybody else believes something different from you. So I wouldn't ask you to, to, to do that. But you could probably imagine if you stopped believing the things your parents and community believed, that would upset the apple cart, wouldn't it? Like, it wasn't easy to start telling people, hey, I don't believe in God, I'm an atheist. Many were disappointed in me. Many thought, like, they had failed certain things. And I said, look, it's not your fault, Mom and Dad. I didn't blame my Bible teachers. I just have to follow what's true. And I don't think Christianity's true. In fact, I think it's harmful and dangerous and damaging to the world. Now, I guess I look at it like this. I'm guessing in your English and history classes, how many of you have studied, like, the ancient Greco-Roman gods, like Zeus and Poseidon? You know these stories. Right? Okay, good. Almost all your hands went up. So, like, when the ancient Greeks couldn't explain something like, say, earthquakes, what did they say was the cause? The gods are, gods are angry, right? Or they couldn't explain something like, say, rain, what did they say was the cause? The gods are crying. No, gods don't cry. The goddesses were crying. That joke actually worked before the Wonder Woman movies, but it doesn't work anymore. Uh, bottom line is, for the ancient Greco-Roman stories, they didn't understand why the ground moved. They lacked a scientific natural explanation. So they inserted God as an explanation when they lacked a natural one. The problem with doing that, it's called God of the gaps, is as science advances, what happens? Those gaps get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, where people used to think God acted, we can now explain it naturally. I think this is true for miracles. I think this is true for the stories of Jesus, etc. I don't believe in the supernatural. Now, just so you, it, it, look, if Christianity was true, I would believe it. I teach philosophy, so I train people how to think, how to recognize good thinking, how to follow the truth, how to recognize bad thinking. So if Christianity were true, I would believe it. I'd love to believe in an afterlife some kind of heavenly state. I just can't talk myself into belief something for which I don't find good evidence, and I find good evidence against it. Now, I could keep talking about my classes, my life, but I actually think it'd be more interesting. Uh, your beloved teacher told me that you have interactions where he kind of role plays different worldviews, so you're used to this dialogue. I'd be happy to just take questions. What would you like to ask an atheist philosophy professor and I'll do my best to respond. So if the two of you, I see over there, I see Mr. O'Neill over here. If you hold your mic up, they'll just come follow you. Anything you want to ask a professor is fair game, and I'll do my best to respond. If you guys will spread out, we'll get as many questions as possible. Let's do it. Hi. So you like to talk about philosophical arguments, correct? So I would like to know what you think about the world and its creation as a whole philosophically and how the world, if it's so fine-tuned to its creation, how something bigger or outside didn't create it. Okay, so I heard the first part. What do I think about the origin of creation? Repeat yes. the second part for me again very quickly. So fine-tuning, right? I'm sure you know what that oh, is. Oh, fine-tuning. Yes, yes. fine-tuning. So if the world was so specifically made, and we assume that a greater force out there had created it, what is okay. your philosophical argument against that? Okay, so let me jump in. So one is the question of, say, the origin of the universe creation. Now, I don't think the universe was created. I don't believe in creation because that word implies a creator and a mind. That's the very thing I'm not convinced that actually exists. So I actually think the data shows that while our universe had a beginning, when you look at string theory, you'll find what's called the multiverse. And if you're following the, you know, the shows like WandaVision and other and The Flash, like they toy in the multiverse in science fiction. But there's actually good reason to believe. Sorry if I ruined it for some of you. Too bad. You had time. Um, do you know who saved Endgame? Can I ruin that one for you? I'm kidding. I won't. The multiverse, I think string theory points towards that reality. So our universe had a beginning, but I don't think the multiverse did. 
it's eternal and it's always been here. And there's reasons for that we could go into. Uh, Fine-tuning, if this were the only universe that existed, then I think we would be surprised that it happens to be so seemingly exquisitely fine-tuned to allow life. But since it's not, and there's more probabilistic resources in the universe, I don't see why fine-tuning is a problem. In fact, if there is a multiverse, we wouldn't expect to find ourselves in a universe that's not fine-tuned because we couldn't live in such a universe. We'd expect to find ourselves in the very kind of universe that we do find ourselves in. Oh, she can go again. I don't. I didn't want. I. I have no power here. I didn't mute you. Yeah. No. I. I was just gonna have a follow-up question. So you pick specifically on the word choice of creator or creating. So whether or not we see that as God or something else. I just don't understand where you're coming from in the sense that thinking that this world isn't created, whether that be this universe or the multiverse as a whole. Well, I don't think the universe had a beginning. The multiverse, that's really what I mean by the universe. I don't think it had a beginning. Hence, it doesn't need any cause outside of the universe. Now, if you say that the universe needs a creator, then why wouldn't the creator need a creator? Why could the creator just exist, but the universe can't? That would be my question. So if you're going to be consistent, either they both need some kind of cause, or they both just exist. You believe God just exists. I believe the universe just exists, so minimally we're at an impasse. Good question. Anybody else? I see one up here. Any others? Spread out, even while they're talking. One so up Mr. Top Stewart in there. was supposed to be the, the downstairs guy, but I guess I'll do both, Mr. Stewart. All right, let's, we'll try to get in as many as we can, so keep your hands up, and they'll come to you. Shh. Go ahead. So you said earlier you, don't, you weren't even sure if Jesus was a real person. I'm not talking about, like, if he was God or, like, anything. Like, you said he wasn't, you weren't sure if he was real. He, he might have been. I think the evidence is late and contradictory and legend-filled, so I'm not fully convinced. So the legend-filled, would that be like the Roman who believed in the, like, his gods and everything else would be blasphemy and he'd hate everything? Even him saying that he was a real person is based on legend? That's what I just wanted to Wait, sure. Jesus saying he's a real person would be legend? No, so the Roman saying Jesus existed and Jesus was a person. Well, there's no good early Roman source that does. Josephus. Josephus was Jewish, for one. He was a Roman historian, Second, uh, he was writing for Rome, but he was not Roman. Josephus was That's Jewish. Josephus mentions 33 people by the name of Jesus. 33 people. Have you read the Antiquities of the Jews? I have not read that yet. Okay, so listen, that's all right. I would encourage you to read it. It's like saying somebody referred to Mike or John today. Jesus was a very common name in the Jewish world because it refers to Joshua, like a savior. So yeah, he refers to a bunch of people by the name of Jesus, but that's hardly reference to the historical biblical Jesus. Second reason I don't trust Josephus is in Antiquities of the Jews, chapter 18, Josephus allegedly refers to uh, Jesus as risen on the third day, crucified, performing miracles, and being the Messiah. Would any Jew believe that? The answer is no. A Jew by religion. Josephus is not quoted for the first eight centuries of the church. It's not an, it's really the 10th century that any church historian quotes Josephus, because the passage that allegedly refers to Jesus was tweaked and interpolated and not actually written by Josephus. Yeah. Hey, good question. That's okay. I appreciate your your thinking. You guys are wrestling with these ideas here. I commend you for that. Go ahead. So, I have a question about the universe. Okay, so, um, you said that the universe wasn't created, but how do you know that it wasn't created if we know that it 
it is constantly dying. Like, we know the universe is expanding, right? So, and energy is dispelling every second. Um, like, how do you know that it is, sorry, the microphone is so weird. It's fine, sorry. Um, <laughs> how do you know that it is endless if um, the universe is constantly dying? Okay, let, 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 me, let me jump in for a second. Because the echo makes it kind of hard to yeah. hear, state your question distinctly and clearly. And the first one was, if the universe is expanding, wouldn't it have had a beginning? Well, there's two things that can be said to this. Yeah. Yeah. Number one is there's good reason to believe we have an expanding and a contracting universe, kind of like a xylophone. And how would we believe this? Because as we look out further into the universe, we see red-shifted stars, which tell us on the longer wavelength of light that the universe is expanding. We also have some blue-shifted stars, which tells us that there's also contraction. So, yeah, the universe is expanding, but I think it's also contracting uh, as well. But if it's expanding, should it be from the one point? from a single point. It should expand from somewhere. Why did the universe have to come from something? Then you have to ask that question for God. Where did God come from? Well, it should come from somewhere. Like, we can't deny that the universe was created and then it started to expand from one point. I, I'm not sure I'm fully tracking, maybe because of the sound, but we have reason to believe the universe is expanding and contracting. If there was a beginning to this, you're still only dealing with our universe, not the multiverse. So it doesn't get us all the way to an explanation that would require God. That's my question. Good. All right. I see, some, I see a hand down here. I see a few in the back. Again, just if, if you don't mind, get as quickly to your question and distinctly as you can. Please. Okay, so um, earlier when you were addressing Madison's question... Let's were, take, while we're talking, go ahead and pull your mask off, then we right. can hear. So there earlier while you were addressing Madison's question, you noted that the multiverse had to be an eternal type thing in order for the beginning of our universe to be created. So... Um, Going off of that, do you believe that the components of something created needs to be in that which created it? So, like, for example, with the creation of our world, we have intellectual minds. And from that, with the multiverse, how did the intellectual minds come, like, initiate or develop through something that didn't have that property? Okay, so if I understand, you're asking the question of consciousness. How did a universe that seemingly at the beginning was physical do things like minds emerge through that process? Yes. Did I capture your question? Yes. Okay, good. So, yes, the universe is physical. Wait, don't leave yet because she might want to follow up. But there's certain capacities for what are called emergent properties at the right level of complexity and diversity to emerge. So take, for example, hydrogen and oxygen. They're two physical molecules or elements. You put them together and you have water. Now, a new property emerges called wetness. It doesn't exist just in hydrogen, doesn't exist just in oxygen, but somehow when these two physical properties emerge, you these two elements emerge, you have this new property develop out of it. Well, I think the same is true when it comes to the emergence of consciousness, that at a certain level of complexity, this new element, it's an epiphenomenon of consciousness, emerges like wetness. And what's interesting is you look throughout the evolutionary history of our world, and you can see simpler organisms aren't really conscious, but there's a basic awareness of pain. 
and then you have consciousness, and then you have self-consciousness. You have this complete increasing complexity go on as the evolutionary story unfolds. All right, we're going to jump up here. Go ahead. If you, if you don't follow um, an afterlife or a sort of meaning of life right now, um, a sort of greater purpose, where do you personally and where do you suggest others find vocational motivation? That's a good question. So let me answer this in a couple ways. I would presume, correct me if I'm wrong, you believe purpose is top-down that God has made this world, He infuses it with purpose, and we find our purpose in God in some fashion. Is that fair? Fair, yeah. Okay. I think purpose comes from the bottom up. I don't think there's a God. I don't think there's a grand design. But as we look at this amazing story of evolutionary history, we have things like friendship. We have good food. We have knowledge. We have freedom. These are all good things that give our lives purposes, even if there is no God that exists. And I think as we look at human beings across different cultures, we find this common recognition that our lives can be purposeful, even if there's no afterlife or they differ about God. So, say, if everything dies, if everything eventually will end, then why continue at all? Why continue at all? Because I don't win in the end? Correct. Okay. Think about it this way. How many football players do we have here? Let me see your hands. Let me see hands. Football players. Okay. If we said tomorrow we're having a scrimmage against the Kansas City Chiefs, even though you're going to lose, actually, they got smoked. You might beat them. Let's go with the Buccaneers. Okay? If we're going to play the Buccaneers, is there any chance you're going to win? The answer is no. You effectively have zero chance of winning, maybe negative chance. How many football players would be like, I don't care. I get to get on the field with Tom Brady and with the Buccaneers. I'm playing anyways. How many of you would still play because you want to get on the field with those guys? Right? That'd be awesome. So even though you can't win, so to speak, in the end, it doesn't mean that experiences are not valuable. In fact, I would actually say as an atheist, um, my life is finite, it's not infinite. So I think this life has more value because this is all I have. So I don't get this morning back. I don't think I live for infinity and I spent it with you guys. That tells me that I think there's something important about thinking and relationships and growing. So not believing in God, I think, actually makes life more purposeful and meaningful. Over here, I want to make sure people can follow up with their questions uh, as well. I don't want to filibuster here. Oh, I'm, okay, go ahead. Um, so if the Bible contains hundreds of prophecies fulfilled um, after they were written... Uh, even being fulfilled, like, as of now in the 21st century, how would that be possible without an omniscient God? So give me one example of a prophecy you think, like, the virgin birth or something, or which? No, like, uh, the measuring of Israel in the end times. Wh which one? Measuring of Israel in the end times. The, in the, okay, we can't deal with something in the end times no, because like, it hasn't been fulfilled yet. Well, it's being fulfilled now. So give, give me an example of a prophecy prophesied ahead of time that was distinctly fulfilled that you think is supernatural. I mean, you could go with the birth of Jesus or the crucifixion of Jesus. Birth of Jesus or the crucifixion of Jesus? Yeah. Okay, let's go to the birth of Jesus, okay, since you started there. Um, when that prophecy was written according to you, before Jesus came on the scene, in the book of Micah, correct? I believe so. It is correct. So, Jesus claims to be the Messiah. Would he have been aware of this prophecy? Are you asking me a question? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I guess so, yeah. Well, of course he was, right? In Luke chapter 2, Jesus knew the law so well, even the leaders reflected upon this, okay? I don't think Jesus is real. I'm telling the story from your perspective. Jesus would have known this prophecy. So if he's trying to proclaim himself as the Messiah, do you think by the time he's 33, three decades removed from this, he would start telling people that he's from the area of Bethlehem? And later followers who believe this would start telling that as well. The answer is, of course. So I would need some actual proof that he's from that area and didn't invent this like he did other prophecies to believe it's really supernatural. And the evidence that Jesus is from Bethlehem outside of the Gospels only emerges in the third century, 300 years removed. So I don't, I just, I don't buy it. You can give me another example, we could talk about it. But either the prophecies, you have people writing the New Testament, reading back on the Old Testament, pulling things out of context, like the virgin birth. If you actually read Isaiah 7 on the virgin birth, it has nothing to do with the Messiah. And the Hebrew word is for a young girl, not even a virgin. And the New Testament writers apply that as if to Jesus when it was never implied that way in the Old Testament. Or people like Jesus intentionally try to fulfill him because they're aware of him, and he's trying to convince people he's the Messiah. But you also have some false prophecies we could talk about if you wanted to as well. Like when Jesus says, you know, his return, people in this generation will see it. Well, we're at least 20 generations after this plus, and Jesus still hasn't come back. So I don't buy the positive prophecies, and I think there's examples of false prophecies. Is this on? That's loud. Hi. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Um, And from here, it looks like you have a wedding ring on. Are you married? Am I married? This is getting really personal. Just answer. Just answer. Wow. Yes, sir. What is your standard for love? If you have no foundation in Jesus, I see no reason to love people at all. So what's your standard? Well, okay, shh. I can tell you my standard is not Jesus, because despite what people say, he did and believed a lot of things we all know are not loving. And I'll give you some examples of this. Supposedly there's demons. Wait, don't leave. She might want to follow back up. Don't leave her. I want, oh, you do have the mic. Um, supposedly there's demons, and instead of casting them out, he runs them into a herd owner's pigs and sends, what was it, 2,000 pigs into the ocean. Like, why would Jesus, if he was God, he didn't have to ruin the guy's herd. That didn't sound very loving to me. Second, Jesus believes in the Old Testament, and you look at a lot of the violence in the Old Testament, that's hardly the kind of thing a loving God would do. So I don't look to the Bible for love. Now, are there some things Jesus taught that were good? Sure. Like loving your enemies, that's a pretty powerful teaching Jesus thought. He taught, I'm okay with that. My standard of love doesn't come from some ancient book written 2,000 years ago. It comes from common sense and reflection on how human beings best flourish. So I just look at my wife and I say, what words can I say that are kind to her? How can I treat her respectfully? How do I be a good husband? How do I be a good dad? How do I be faithful to her? Like these, you might say these are Christian values, but they're also Buddhist values. They're also Hindu values. That's because they're human values. So I don't need an ancient book to know what it means to love my wife. In fact, I think that ancient book wouldn't help me because the way it treats women, but separate issue. Go ahead. Are you done or did you want to come back? Are you married? Definitely not. So if you believe in things from a scientific standpoint, you do, right? Like scientific? I couldn't quite make that out. Do you believe in things from a scientific perspective? Like the creation and life? You base it around science? I, 
I honest, for some reason, the echo, I believe what? Do you believe in creation from a scientific perspective? Do I believe creation from a scientific perspective? I don't believe creation from any perspective. Okay. Well, then, what are your thoughts on just, like, the law of conservation of matter and how things can't be created or destroyed? You said how you think the universe is constantly expanding. Uh, okay. So, slow down. The first law of thermodynamics, which you call the law of conservation of energy, says that matter is neither created nor destroyed. Correct? Yes. Yes. Who believes matter was created? You or me? Well, I was thinking you, because you stopped. No, about I, I just said I don't believe matter was created, because that implies a creator. Are you a Christian? You believe in God? Yes. So you believe matter was created. The yes. first law that you cited says matter's neither created nor destroyed. Uh -huh. That's not a problem for me. I don't, I don't think it was created or destroyed. I say, yep, that's scientific fact. You're the one who believes it was created. So how do you think the universe is expanding without matter being created? How is it expanding? You said it, how you thought the universe was Oh, expanding. That's, that's easy. Put buttons on a balloon. If you expand the balloon, what happens? The buttons get further and further from one another. There's not more matter. It's an expansion of the existing matter. So it's just more empty space growing? Well, yeah. You, I mean, you could look at it that way. It gets more precise than that. But yeah, it's not the constant creation of matter for the universe to expand. It's a different relationship of the existing matter. That's it. Okay. Hey, good questions, by the way. Very thoughtful. Back there, go. Hi. Um, my name is Olivia. It's very nice to meet you. Um, okay. So you have said repeatedly throughout today that you believe in science, yes? Uh, broadly, yes, sure. Broadly. Okay. So we'll take that. Um, so I was wondering, when a trial or tribulation, per se, comes into your life, how do you explain the origin of that? And how do you endure that as an atheist? A trial or tribulation? If something happens, let's say a death or something oh, that you can't really, or like no explainable something reason for it. totally unforeseen, like a pandemic or something like that. Sure, how do I deal with it? something okay. unfair. So because I embrace science, as a means of knowing the world doesn't mean I only embrace science as a means of knowing and experiencing the world. That's what's called scientism. I don't embrace scientism. I think it's a testable, powerful way that's given us medicine, communications, uh, transportation, etc. So when something like a pandemic hits, I don't go to the Bible. I turn to science because science has given us vaccines. Science is testing whether masks work. It was scientists who at the bubonic plague said, this isn't a condemnation from God. Maybe there's a scientific explanation, viruses, bacteria, let's figure it out, that led to helping mankind. Now, personally, what do I do? I turn to family, I turn to friends, I turn to other human beings who help us through this. And we have helped each other. That's what it means to be human, to be a collective species. Okay, so if you don't believe, because I believe, I mean, I think a lot of us believe in science in addition to what we personally believe, just as you do. So then what else do you believe in? Because you said that you turn to your family and your friends and everything else, but I believe that there is something that can't be verbalized about humanity. There's something that we feel that's a little inexplicable, and I, being a Christian, I believe that it has Christian origin. What do you, in addition to science, believe yeah. to be an explanation? So I understand the religious sentiment. Where I teach at UCLA, I will have Buddhist students who will say, I feel this deeper spiritual sense. I'll have Muslim students who will say that. But the way you described it, a feeling, is ultimately a physical thing. So I have awe at the universe. 
I have awe at certain natural processes. I have awe when a child is born. We live in a pretty amazing place, but I don't see any evidence that there's a transcendent being outside of the universe that exists. That's where we differ. So I have feelings of awe. I believe there's something bigger than humanity that's going on, but not in an immaterial, spiritual sense. I don't find any evidence for the existence of such a being. So I think maybe that's where we differ. I also believe in history, believe in psychology, sociology. There's a lot of ways of knowing things about the world outside of science, but I don't believe there's a personal God in that spiritual sense, and mainly because of the problem of evil. But I could talk about that if someone wants to. Who's got the mic? Up top. Go. Hello. Oh, right here, and then we'll come to the top. So I have two questions for you. The first one is in relation to the multiverse theory, right? So that theory has not been proven. And so if you're, you're going to use that for your answer to the fine-tuning, correct? And it's not a proven theory? Okay, slow down. So the multiverse. How do you know the multiverse has not been proven? How do you know, I know that? I know it's in a situation and a speculation where it cannot be proven as well. No, no, I'm asking, how do you know? By the way, I wouldn't use the term prove, because in philosophy that implies 100% certainty. But the consistent evidence points towards a multiverse, for example, from string theory. So it is currently the best explanation of reality embraced by virtually all cosmologists and philosophers. Okay, so it's the, the best answer as of right now. Well, yeah, look, I mean, this is life. We have to reason things together and make assessments from them. Just because something's not 100% certain doesn't mean it's not reasonable. So then do you take out the fine-tuning when you're looking at that? And so you disregard that and saying, so if this theory isn't proven because it's not 100% certain, then are you just not going to look at the fine-tuning? Because that proves evidence as to there being a creator as opposed to look at this theory of the multiverse, which cannot be proven completely. Did you hear anything that I just said? I heard, yes, you said, yes. You said it's, a, it's the best answer as of right now. I mean, honestly, knowledge does not require certainty. And we know from string theory, have you read The Grand Design by Stephen Hawking? That, that evidence points towards a multiverse. If you could give me better evidence against it, I'd be happy to give that up and not believe it. I have no problem with that. But you can't say uncertain equals not proven, therefore we don't know. That's not how philosophy and knowledge works. Yes. So there may be fine-tuning, but that fits within the multiverse scenario because we couldn't observe ourselves in a universe that were not fine-tuned. Mm -hmm. So it fits perfectly within the, within the theory that I've laid out. And I, my second question for you is about the supernatural. So different things as opposed to just supernatural events that occur in the Bible, but that have occurred in modern day times. And like think, because I've grown up as a Pentecostal Christian. So I've witnessed several times the casting out of demons and prophesying. And so um, I've, I've witnessed prophecies have been fulfilled and I've witnessed the several times the casting out of demons with the same reaction through several people. So what would be the best answer through that? Okay, so when somebody says they have a personal experience, obviously because I wasn't there, yes. and none of this is documented, there's no way I can give an honest assessment of that event. Mm -hmm. That's impossible to do with any integrity. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you is every single time somebody has shared a testimony with, like this, I say, give me the evidence. Show me that the person wasn't schizophrenic, mm -hmm. didn't have a mental disorder, that there's not another explanation for this. Mm -hmm. Never is the supernatural left standing. Why doesn't somebody film it and put it on YouTube? Why doesn't somebody get a peer-reviewed journal article from it? That's all I'm asking for. So I can't assess your personal experience. Yes. I wasn't there. But I would say your worldview of believing in God is going to shape the way, and this is true for me as well, it's going to shape the way you process that experience, strip that worldview out of it. I think you're going to find very solid naturalistic explanations for it. But if you can send me data, mm -hmm. I'd be happy to look at it. Okay. Good questions. Let's go up top. 
We're just going to go with one it, each because of time. Oh. oh, good afternoon. Are you familiar with the Shroud of Turin? With the Shroud of Turin, yes. Um, could you explain why you believe that the Shroud of Turin is not physical evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yes, because the most recent carbon dating dates it to the Middle Ages, about 1500. Um, but what, what do you say to the objections that the carbon dating is incorrect um, due to the neutron absorption theory? So if there only were carbon dating on the shroud and we had reason to doubt it, then I would find that uh, a legitimate point. Carbon dating works to about six to 10,000 years and back. That's all it works back. So you can't date things older than 10,000 years through carbon dating. So that's a fair question that you're raising. But the shroud at most is 2,000 years old. So I don't find any reason to test, to question that of the shroud. Plus, pollen from the Middle Ages has been found on other parts of the shroud and it can't be dated in existence before 1500. But I believe there was pollen found that dated back to the first century as well. You believe that or you actually know that and can give me some evidence for that? I'm, I'm fairly certain. So that's not gonna do it for me as a philosophy professor. I'm gonna need some evidence. Okay, so there was pollen found on the shroud from the first century because the pollen retains its molecular form um, it remains stable over long periods of time. So there was pollen found on the shroud from the Near Eastern area that would correlate to pollen found in Israel, which... Okay, so listen very carefully. I've read the recent data from a Jewish scholar named Dan Sherbach, and he's not convinced that it can date to the first century uh, for a number of reasons, and these pollen things are very, very questionable. One question he raises is there could be material preserved from the first century, doesn't mean the shroud itself was imprinted in the first century. That's one question that he raises. But he says that idea that pollen from then is very, very skeptical and breaks down. That was not assessed through carbon dating. That was assessed through another means. It. Now, at most, the shroud would simply say that some figure who matches the description of Jesus existed and was crucified. At most, that's all that would follow from it. But I'm still not even convinced that that can be traced. Like in the chain of custody in a police event, you can only use evidence if you can trace where it's been right back to the crime scene. When it comes to the shroud, there's questionable dating, and there's no way to trace it back within the first few centuries. So I'm just not persuaded by it. But if you know some good evidence for the shroud, I'd be happy to entertain it. Who's got the mic? Go. So earlier when we were talking about love, you used the story of Jesus casting out the pigs, but he never sent them to the pigs. All he did was cast the demons out of the man, and they fled in fear of Jesus into the pigs and ran off the cliff. The story you told made it seem like Jesus um, basically sent the demons to possess the pigs and killed them. So that story doesn't really work as an example of Jesus not being loving because you didn't tell the actual story. Okay, I, I, I'm not following you. Maybe it's because the mask. But let me ask you very quickly. Is G, do you believe Jesus is God? He is the Son of God. Yes or no? Is Jesus God? Yes. Could Jesus have cast out the demons without killing the thousands of pigs that that man owned? Yes or no? God has given yes everything. Yes or no, could Jesus have casted out those demons without killing the man's pigs? Yes or no? You're limiting the question to two answers that aren't necessarily the only two answers. No, actually, these are exclusive options. Either Jesus could have done it or he could not have done it. There is no third option. Could, did Jesus have the power? Let me answer it for you. If Jesus is God, he can cast out demons without sending them into a bunch of pigs. Who agrees with that? Let me see your hands. If Jesus is God, he can cast out demons without sending them into pigs. Who agrees with that? It's not very hard. 
And so given that he could have done something without harming the man's property, and he didn't, at least raises the questions of his loving actions towards that man. If you own those pigs, I think you'd have felt very differently. The demons fled. He didn't cast them out. They saw Jesus and they knew who he was. They were afraid. They ran away. God has given living things free will, so he can't force them to do something. Uh, sure he can. All right. Tell me how. He does it all the time when you're reading the scriptures. He forces demons out of people. He could kill a demon if he's God. He's God. It's okay. not that hard. Now, you're right. They recognized him, but that was at the beginning. At the end, he could have sent them anywhere. So if they were going to go back into that man, could he have stopped them from going back into that man? Yes. Yes. Then I think you answered your question. You didn't answer the question about Jesus being loving. You just keep avoiding the questions people ask. Wait, Jesus, I didn't answer the question about Jesus being loving? No. You, we've asked you how you define love, and all you did was tell us a mixed-up story about how Jesus cast out demons and sent them to pigs. Okay, I'm not sure you were listening. She asked me how I define love, and, and I said, define it. I don't define it by the Bible. I don't look to Jesus because of stories like this. And then I went on to explain how I know what it means to love somebody independently of the Bible. That was the point. So to love somebody is simply when you care about that person's emotional and physical and their life development. That's what it means to love somebody. I don't need an ancient Bible to tell me that. That's common sense. And I apply that in my relationship with my wife. So I did answer the question. All right. I also have another... You've asked a few. No also's. Let's go to someone else. That was one. Let's do one. Go. Noon. Um, I'm wondering, because as a Christian, I base my morality in, like, objective beliefs by the ethics Jesus taught. So I'm wondering, as an atheist what you perceive right and wrong as, and if you judge it based on what you personally view as right and wrong, what gives you the right to punish criminals or people who commit genocide if they're acting upon their own will and what they perceive as right? Okay, so I think I heard you. When I'm done, if I didn't answer, come back. The question is, how do I define morality and what gives me the right? I don't think I have the right. Morality is made by societal judgments as a whole based upon what behavior brings flourishing and freedom for the society. I never said I'm an individual relativist who decides right and wrong. We can actually look at certain behavior. Sam Harris lays this out in his 2011 book, The Moral Landscape that certain behavior contributes towards moral flourishing and some behavior takes it away. We can assess this. It's not opinion. It's actually fact. So if it's based on what society deems right and wrong, like you're saying... No, I didn't say that. I, thought, I didn't say I, that. I thought you just said it was based on what society no. deems right and wrong. I never said that. I said I don't have the right to punish oh. somebody. Oh, okay societies and governments have that, right. have that right. By the way, even if I were a Christian, I would believe that because of what Paul says in Romans 13. Yeah. So it's not an individual assessment. Morality is determined by looking at human behavior and seeing its outcomes and flourishing or lack of flourishing with others. So I'm not a societal relativist even though society carries out that moral duty. Just like society gives us education, society has other roles and responsibilities. Um, so my question is that you keep saying that you're not sure if Jesus was real or not. Okay, so let's take out that part. And I just wanted to say, because the whole basis of Christianity is the resurrection. 
How would you, Sean McDowell, disprove Christianity with your so-called evidence? How would I disprove Christianity? The, the resurrection, I mean. Um, let me see what time it is. Twelve twenty. Okay, so this is a fair question to one degree. Okay, the burden of proof is not on me to disprove Christianity any more than the burden of proof is on you to disprove every other religion who claims to have the truth. If somebody says Christianity is true, show us that it's true and give us the evidence for the resurrection. Do you see how burden of proof… I'll answer your question, but do you see how the question is not on me to disprove it? The question is first on you to prove it if you want anyone to take it seriously. That's how it works. Now, Growing up, I thought the Christian story was unique, that there was only a resurrection, I was told, in Christianity. But if you actually look at these ancient pagan mystery religions, Osiris, Adonis, Isis, Mithras, you find an incredible similarity, the same kind of details you find in the Christian story. So Mithras was born of a virgin. Mithras had 12 disciples claimed to be God, was a teacher, and was resurrected on the third day. So as you start to look at these stories and the parallels in the Christian story and the lack of positive evidence, you start to realize this is just another mythological story that more people believe from the ancient world. That's the quick take, but go ahead. Did you want to come back? We're good. Um, it's because there has, like, when you come and you talk about these myths, um, it's just like you said it. These myths, they're just trying to explain natural phenomena. So, I don't think that you could compare these myths to Christianity in that sense. Why not? Like, that's your opinion. There's just the similarities that I showed you. Why can't I compare them? across these different religions, you find all of these common threads. Why can't I compare them? <laughs> all right. Good, good question. All right, so here's, here's the deal. We're, we're running out of time. Um, so I'm going to take the last 15 minutes and uh, tell you about what I really do. I'm not a philosophy professor. I'm not an atheist. I'm not an atheist. I actually teach at a Christian university in Southern California, a private school called Biola. And uh, I teach at a private Christian school part-time as well, high school Bible. I am married to my high school sweetheart, first met her in third grade, so I'm not a bad guy. Um, I do this a lot at different schools. Usually, I set people up and let them know I'm a Christian first. But you're, where are you? Where are you, Mr. Stewart? So, oh, he left. He's like, I'm out of here now that he's revealing the truth. Oh, there you are. We're like, let's just see what happens if we set them up and make them think that I'm an atheist first. See if that changes the nature of the dynamic. So, I'm a Christian I'm actually an apologist. This is what I do. I've written, I don't know, 15 or 20 books. I uh, teach apologetics at a graduate program at Biola University. I speak and I debate atheists and others because I think it's fun. How many of you honestly were like, I knew it? No, you weren't like six or seven of you. All right, all right, all right. Okay, so here's the deal. We only have about 15 minutes to, to go, and then I got to let you go. I want to make you think about a few things, all right? First off, don't answer this, but why don't you reflect in your heart a little bit, just personally. As a whole, how do you think you treated your atheist guests? There's probably a mix. I hear somebody shout out terribly, <laughs> okay? Now, I've done this Youth groups of 12 students. I did this at a church in the Philippines with 8,000 students. And I think that was too many, actually, come to think of it. 
And your response was pretty typical. In fact, a few of you, I was actually encouraged, tried to be like, hey, thanks for coming. Tried to be like, how do I ask this question in a cordial fashion, which I like? Okay? Here's the deal. The more I do this with people, here's how I find Christians respond. How many of you felt like maybe you're a little bit defensive, a little bit testy, a little bit upset? I, if you couldn't see it, I could see it in a lot of your eyes, by the way. Some of you are like, I'm ready for this guy to leave, which is okay. Um, here's one reason why I'm convinced we get a little bit defensive. Part of it is if we don't know what we believe and why we believe it, and somebody starts challenging us, what happens? We, we get defensive, right? We get upset. Do you understand why knowing what you believe is so important? Then we don't get threatened when people challenge our ideas. I don't, if somebody challenges my ideas, I don't get defensive. At least I try not to get defensive because I know why I think Christianity is true. I've thought about it, and I think there's good answers for it. You see, I'm a Christian for one reason, one reason alone. It's not because it makes me feel good. It's not because my parents are Christians. It's not because I teach at a Christian school. I'm a Christian because I actually think it's true. I actually think Christianity is true and best explains reality. If I didn't think it were true, I would give it up. I would give it up. So I think you should only be a Christian if you actually think that it's true. That's the best reason to be a Christian. Okay? Now, with that said, I was doing this event in Texas a number of years ago, and I spoke, and these students got really defensive and testy. This girl, kind of the back left middle, stands up, and she goes, Mr., I just want to read you something. I said, okay, what do you want to read me? She said, it's from the Bible, the Holy Word of God. I said, you know, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in the Bible. She goes, I don't care. Listen up. She's going to be a great parent someday. She reads to me Psalms 14.1, which says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. I said, so you're calling me a fool? She goes, you're a fool. Bible says it. That settles it. I believe it. Sits down. Her friends jump up. They're like, woo hoo hoo Got you, fool. And they start pointing at me. Well, when it was done, students surrounded me for a while because they had a ton of questions. And this girl waited till everybody was gone. And she came up to the front. She was 17 years old, she told me. And she goes, thank you for doing your best to defend atheism. I was like, sure, why are you thanking me? She goes, well, I'm an atheist. I said, really, you're at a Christian camp? That's great you're here. How did you get here? She said, well, I am a leader in my youth group. I said, I feel like I'm missing something here. <laughs> she said, I grew up in the church. I, I can't remember if she went to Christian school or not, Christian family. I've been told this stuff my whole life. I started to realize I have questions, and my parents and family, they just deflected my questions. I started to realize I don't believe this anymore. I said, well, have you told anyone? She said, you're the first person I've told. I said, why haven't you told anyone else? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, because I'm afraid they'll treat me like they just treated you. And I was like, Oh my goodness. I don't think we realize as Christians the stories we tell, the attitudes we have, the jokes we laugh at, what it often communicates to people who are not believers. So I just, I just want you to reflect upon this. I have no stake in this game. Maybe you don't believe in God, but if you were not a believer in God and you're watching this, what would your impression of Christians be? That's worth asking. Christians are thoughtful, they're patient, they're gracious, they love atheists, or would it be something else? I don't know the answer to that, but that's what I want you to think about. I was speaking at a conference in Duluth, Minnesota, and there were 1,500 students. I turned around to start my atheist role play because uh, they knew I actually was a Christian, and this group of students go, boo, boo, go home, Mr. Atheist. And a youth pastor shouts out, you're going to hell, like he shouts it out. 
And so I went off script. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. I was called to share my atheist story. Like, why would you boo me? And I started laying into these students. I said, wait a minute. Keep in mind, there's like 1,500 students. I said, you think Jesus would boo an atheist guest or treat him that way? Like, Jesus was accused of being a friend of sinners. Jesus actually said to love your enemies. I said, what about Paul? 1 Corinthians 13 says, if you speak in tongues or you speak words of prophecy, but you have not love, you have nothing. I mean, this stadium was silent, which proves there's a God because junior hires were present. The next summer I was speaking, one or two summers later, in Salt Lake City, and I turned around to start my atheist role play, and this group of students go, woo-hoo-hoo, we love you, Mr. Atheist. And that, like, took me by surprise. So afterwards I was like, why were you cheering for the atheist? And they're like, well, we were part of the group that booed you in Minnesota. And instantly I thought, they got the point. They got the point. You see, friends, when it comes to communication, there's two things. There's content, and then there's the way we communicate that content. There's the message and the medium. There's a truth to Christianity, but there's also a way we are supposed to communicate it. Jesus came in grace, and he came in truth. We are supposed to speak the truth, but do it in love. Truth in love. What does our culture lack today? <laughs> Grace, patience, kindness. You're growing up in an unbelievably divided culture where there is hate and vitriol across the political and religious aisle. What's going to set Christianity apart? Number one, Christianity is actually true. But number two, they will know you by your love. Proverbs says, a soft word breaks a bone. Scripture says, a gentle word turns away wrath. In fact, it's in Romans where Paul says, it's your kindness that leads to repentance. Now, I realize with some of you, I was pushing buttons and twisting your words. I get that. I understand. As a whole, you ask some very thoughtful questions, which I love, and I think you're like trying to do this in a cordial relational way. So give yourself some grace on this. But instead of standing up here today and saying, hey, let's love our neighbors, I want to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. So you'd ask yourself, how do I navigate conversations, online or offline? Do I just want to win an argument? Do I want to sound smart? Or do I actually want to love somebody? Because that's what Jesus said is the greatest commandment. Love God and love other people. I take my high school students every year on a trip, and we often go to Berkeley, California, which you might as well call Berserkly. It's one of the most secular places in the U.S. and beyond. And we do bring in atheists. We brought in gay activists. We brought in people with very different worldviews to speak to our students. And I tell my students, I'm like, ask them the best questions you can. We want to know truth, but not to sound smart, not to win an argument. But do it in a way that shows love to somebody. Now we have, we literally have five minutes are there one or two questions of things that I said, don't ask me about Calvinism versus Arminianism, are there arguments that I made as an atheist that you want Christian Sean to answer before I let you go? Meaning, is there anything the atheist said that made you think for a second, like you brought up prophecy, the existence of Jesus, Josephus? Shoot your hand up very quickly, go. It has to be something we talked about. Go. So you were talking about, like, the whole science-y stuff, about the multiverse and all of this, like, stuff, which is, like, it was, I couldn't even understand it. I was, I was able to It's fine. Because it was just too much. So why would somebody believe all of that if they just, is it easier for them than believing in a God because, like, they're guilty? Or okay. 
So let me make two points here. Number one, you might have noticed sometimes instead of answering a question, I was like string theory, multiverse, complex words act as if you answer something but really didn't. I played that card a few times. Second, when you ask why somebody believes something, now you're talking about motivation. And people can have very deep reasons for their motivations. So it could be intellectual, that somebody just doesn't think Christianity makes sense. It also could be moral. I had a friend of mine, he looked me in the eyes, he said, I think Jesus is God, but I can't believe. And when I pressed him, he basically said, I'm texting 10 girls, and I'm going to sleep with them. Why would I give that up for some belief? And I kid you not, he said, if that sends me to hell, so be it. And I got a chill down my body. In other words, his motivation was not intellectual, it was moral. Motivation can also be relational. Some people have been treated poorly by Christians and hurt by Christians. So the idea of believing in Christianity is like, why would I want to embrace this religion that the people who represent it have treated me poorly? It can be psychological. So scriptures say, uh, what proverb is it? It says, a man's purposes are deep. And a person of wisdom is able to draw it out. So when I'm in conversation with somebody, I always want to know, what's the root of the issue? Because let's talk about that. Sometimes it's intellectual. Sometimes there's something else driving it. That's a great question. Yes, my man, you did a good job, by the way. Pull your mask down so I can hear you, and you're going to have to be fast. What is your opinion on the Shroud of Turin? You want to know my honest opinion? I think the Shroud of Turin might be genuine, but I'm not certain. I've talked to some experts on it. I've watched some videos on it, and I think, oh, there might be something here. And you were raising a good question in the back about some of the testing. They did test the Shroud of Turin and date it to the Middle Ages, but they tested a patch that was put on, not the rest of the Shroud as a whole. So, I would be happy to say it might be genuine, and some of the experts that I talk to are like, I am 80, 90 percent confident that it's true. But even if it's true, all it proves is that Jesus existed and was crucified. But I believe those things anyways, because Josephus does talk about them. He's Jewish, and my whole story was completely made up, separate issue. Actually, not completely made up, but I don't buy it. So, I think the shroud is The shroud is a part of a larger case for the historicity of Jesus that adds to it, but I don't think it stands on its own apart from the scriptures, early church fathers, and Jews like Josephus, Romans like Tacitus for the existence of Jesus. Great question. Um, What are your thoughts on theistic evolution? On theistic evolution? Okay, so here's what I think. If evolution is true and Jesus rose from the grave, then Christianity is true. The heart of our faith is, who is Jesus? Is he actually God? Did he rise on the third day? If that's true and some kind of evolutionary story is true, I'm a Christian. And I believe in the resurrection. I teach an entire class on this, by the way, because I think the evidence is very compelling that Jesus lived, he died, he was put in a tomb, and appeared to a whole bunch of people, to the women, to the seven, to the twelve, to Peter, to Paul, to James, and they were willing to suffer and die for their belief that they had seen the risen Jesus. So I do believe the resurrection is true, and I think it's compelling on its own. Um, My mind just went blank. What was the start of your question? Oh, theistic evolution. So when it comes to theistic evolution, the idea being typically that the modern story of evolution is true, and somehow God used that. I have Christians who hold that position, 
And I think in the bigger, broader Christian position, that's one option to consider, but it raises very important theological questions, such as the historical Adam. And I also am just not convinced that the evolutionary story is true because of things like the fossil record and the Cambrian explosion. So, bottom line to answer your question is I'm not a theistic evolutionist because I don't think the story behind evolution can explain what people think it does. But if I did become convinced that evolution was true, I wouldn't give up my Christian faith. I would give up my Christian faith if I didn't think Jesus rose from the grave. That's my broad answer. So, are we out of time? Oh, we are out of time. Hey, throw my website up really quickly yeah, if this is helpful so you can know who I actually am. This is actually my website. Um, I actually just did. Somebody asked about paranormal phenomena. I haven't posted it yet. I just did an interview yesterday with a leading doctor about near-death experiences. Absolutely fascinating. Story of people medically dead, resuscitated back to life, and have information they could not possibly have known in the state they were in. Documented cases, which I think confirms there's life after death. I haven't posted that yet, but on the top, so I, ha I have a YouTube channel if you want to know apologetics, theology. I'm doing one in two weeks on marijuana and Christians, like just an interesting topic. Um, scroll down a little bit. There's, so I have a, uh, that's my blog on the right side. It was on transgender sports. That's a new book I didn't talk about on sex, love, and dating just in time for Valentine's Day. Um, we have a podcast, but keep scrolling down to the bottom. This is what will interest you. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, boom, on the very bottom. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. I'm on TikTok. My son is 16 years old. And by the way, he's a shoe reseller. That's where I got these Jordans. Check him out. He's not only a cute, good basketball player, but he resells shoes, and he has like 70,000 followers on TikTok. It's Scott Resells. Seriously, check him out. He's awesome. But I'm on TikTok. He told me, he's like, Dad, if you want to reach my generation, you got to be on TikTok. So I don't do like stupid cat videos. Sometimes I do stuff that's, I think it's funny, and my kids kind of think it's funny. But it's like one-minute apologetic or worldview answers. So you have awesome Bible and apologetic training here. I was really encouraged by that. But TikTok and Instagram in particular, if you want to stay in touch and just amidst the nonsense that comes through that, if you want some positive worldview ideas now and then and stay in touch, that'd be a cool place to do that. So I, I really hate to cut you off. We got to get you guys to lunch in just a second. But here's what's really neat. We have had the second and third best apologists in the country to youth on this campus because the first is our very own Mr. Stewart, of course. Let's give him a huge round of applause. He had this, he had this idea and uh, I think it was tremendous. No, in, in all honesty, we have had the number one and the number two best Christian apologists on, in this country to people your age and adults of all ages and Sean McDowell and Jay Werner Wallace, the cold case Christianity uh, guy back in, uh, back in September. Here's what is very important. Know what you believe and why, even if it's not Christianity. Pursue, hold on just a second, pursue truth. We could, we could have this conversation going for, for hours. I know I could be here, but we can't do it. Continue those questions in Mr. Stewart's class on the website. You guys are dismissed.